رحبوا معي من فضلكم بخبيرة الطب النفسي دكتورة شيفالي تساباري وهي إحدى الكاتبات الأكثر مبيعا وفقا لمجلة نيويورك تايمز فلتتفضل إلى المنصة مشكورة Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming on stage the New York Times best-selling author, psychologist and wisdom teacher Dr. Shifali Tsabari I am so excited to be here, and, and um, it's, a, it's a deep honor that Her Highness uh, even knew about my work and has spearheaded this invitation and this warm welcome, so thank you very much. You know, in my work as a clinical psychologist, I am humbled that I get to enter people's minds and their stories and their lives and I get to see what truly allows us to feel joy, abundance, but also what causes us our deepest pain. And having come from India and now that I work in America and having traveled the world, I have come to realize that there is only a few things that separate us, but all things of the mind and heart are actually shockingly similar. Our dress could be different, our God could be different, our cultural traditions could be different, but what truly allows us to feel free or enslaved is always simply the same. Cross cultures, cross traditions, and cross religions, what allows us to feel our most liberated and what causes us to feel our most pain is all one and the same. This was an epiphany that was at first quite startling to me because I thought surely you would be different and those in America would be different from those in India. But no, because the human spirit, you see, works on the same principles and these principles are what I will share with you today. The greatest danger in the world today is not weapons of mass destruction, is not our differing viewpoints in politics, is not our different gods. The greatest danger and the greatest acts of violence are committed in one place only, the unawakened mind. It is our mind, you see, fully blinded and veiled hidden from its divinity by culture that truly can be the greatest ammunition of mass destruction. Our minds, my mind and your mind, and the mind we raise in our children. One of my youngest clients was a 16-month-old baby. Her mother bought her to me because the mother couldn't understand why her daughter was unresponsive to her. The mother came to me with the baby in her arms and in her bag was a bunch of different flyers of different diagnoses that she thought her daughter had. RAD, my daughter has RAD, which means reactive attachment disorder. My daughter has ADD, attention deficit disorder. My daughter has PDD, pervasive development disorder. And she just kept taking out one flyer out of the other and I, I was in shock. I said to her, uh, how old is your child? And she said, 16 months old. So in those days I used to do home visits because um, Rent was too expensive. I was uh, just graduating from college. And I also realized that one hour in the home could show me 10 hours in therapy and, and make up for the difference in one hour. So I used to go to the home. So I went to her home and I, I was reluctant to make a diagnosis because I know that children this young simply cannot be labeled. But the mother was so convincing. So I thought, you know, maybe this child is some demon child and some special child, so let me go into the home and observe. 
So I watched the mother and daughter feeding at feeding time. And the mother was right. Every time the mother tried to make eye contact, the daughter looked away. Every time the mother put the spoon next to the, mother, the daughter's mouth, the, the child would look away or down. And I was like, by golly, this child is really wicked. Really not a nice child, not a nice baby. At one point, the mother left the room and I was left alone with this scary child. And the moment the mother left, and this is not a made up story, I know it sounds fabricated, the daughter began making eye contact with me. And I was like, shh, don't do this. Your mother will see that you're different with me. Like, I didn't want to be the bad guy. But the daughter began looking at me, and then I would look back, and then I would make facial expressions, and she was alive, and then I would feed her, and her eyes would be locked in me. And I was like, what is happening? This was my first foray, my first entry to watching how childhood patterns could possibly get fixed at such an early age. Could it be that the daughter was picking up something from the mother that young? Could it be that the mother's mind was having an impact on the daughter's psychology that young? So later, when I spoke to the mother, I began to discover that she grew up in a severely dysfunctional home where the father was not very present, was an alcoholic, and there was a disconnect between what she wanted from her life and her parents and this father. There was this severe gap between the connection, in the connection. And later I discovered that when she was pregnant with this daughter, she went through a severe crisis in her own life, an emotional crisis and an identity crisis. And she was afraid to bring this daughter into the world. So I began to think, is it possible that at such a young age, the child can absorb the anxieties and fears of the mother? Is it possible that generational patterns of emotional anguish and distress can be passed down that young, that early? And this was 15 years ago. So since then, this hypothesis that this can happen has only become stronger. So the work I do is about understanding how we transmit our unconscious patterns onto our children from day one, from conception, from preconception. It doesn't matter. It's coming down the generational pike, one generation to the other. Our emotional wounds, our emotional patterns, the way we look at the world, all of it gets stamped onto the next generation. You know, I used to think I was so liberated as a child. I used to think I was a wild child. I used to think I had my own mind. I know you're sitting here and you probably think I'm an individual. I'm conscious. I'm free. She's talking about other people. I wasn't raised like that. I was raised to be autonomous and an individual. Well, I'm sad and sorry to break it to you, but you weren't. You were raised in the same way that your parents were raised. And their wounds and their ways of thinking and their belief systems were passed down to you like a stamp on paper. In fact, it's quite possible that your parents barely even saw you. And this is a tragedy, I know, but to awaken your mind, to free your mind, this realization that you were probably raised as a replica unconsciously by your parents and the culture around you is one of the first realizations to make. To awaken the mind, we have to understand that we have been living a pattern. To awaken the mind, you have to realize that quite possibly you have been a pawn, a sheep in a vast system off to the slaughterhouse where your individuality has been seen as only one in a vast puzzle piece of the culture you were brought up in. Few of us were raised to truly be seen for who it is we are. Even though I was raised by parents who I believe were conscious, it didn't matter because I grew up in a culture that was vastly unconscious. Even though my mother told me, don't be like me, it didn't matter 
Because words are only pointers, words are empty. I absorbed her way of being, and I absorbed the way of being that was told and behaved in, in culture. It doesn't matter the words our parents say. It doesn't matter that they tell us to be strong and brave, free and liberated, courageous and daring. It doesn't matter what words you say to your children. Because if you aren't that way deep within your being, then you aren't. And that's what they will pick up on. Children are master absorbers. They are sponges like no other. They don't really understand what you say because that requires logic and executive functioning and deep thinking. They watch. They sense. They energetically pick up how you are. So I tell women raising daughters, don't tell your daughter she's beautiful and smart and she can be strong out in the world. If she sees you kowtowing to your partner or scared of breaking free. So culture, you see, is one of our biggest obstructors to living a free life. And each one of us here, whether we were raised by loving parents or not, were raised by parents in a culture that told them how it is you needed to be. So each one of us were raised by a prescription list. Look in your pocket, you have one right now. Do you see your prescription list? Look, look, it's there. You don't see it? You don't have to see it, you see, because you're living it. You're living the prescription list. If you're a woman, what are the things you're supposed to be as a woman? Nurturing. What? Gentle. Married, right, straight. It doesn't matter, you just have to bypass your whole childhood, bypass the adventure, the discovery, who am I, no, just get married. And on your way to getting married, you have to be very gentle and very, what else? Patient, you have to sacrifice. And how do you have to look? Beautiful and pretty and skinny, you know, right? You think this is only in your culture? or this is worldwide. It's a worldwide prescription, yes? And men, men are supposed to be what and become what? Men are supposed to be and become what? Tough, right. Look at the, the polar opposite, yes. Providers, understanding of themselves. Understand yourself, love yourself, logical. Commanding. Oh, I never heard that one before. What? Super what? Superman and? Oh, she put both. Superman and rich. No wonder the men are so insecure and drinking all the time. Look at the pressure we put on you. See, we only talk about the pressure women feel. Do you see what pressure men feel? They have to be Superman and rich. I don't even know what Superman means, but they have to be like, uh, super provider, super strong, super leaders. That's a lot of pressure on a guy and a lot of pressure on a woman. So you see these prescription lists, I know they sound funny and we all laugh at them, but don't take them lightly because these are the truths. We are burdened by them. And then of course the prescription of you have to go to school and then when you go to school you have to get good grades, and then after you get good grades, you have to go to college and then good, get good grades. And then if you're a woman, you have to give it up, kind of, and just get married and have good children, and then raise them to go to school. And so the conveyor belt of life continues on and on and on. And the beauty of it is that we can feel safe because we all know what's on the prescription list. There's beauty there, there's comfort there. That's why tradition is comforting, because it's safe. I know what I'm going to wear. I know how I'm going to be. I know which God I'm going to believe in. I know by a certain age I need to get married. It's a beautiful prescribed way to feel safe. But it is not the way to be awakened. Now, if you want to awaken, that's a whole different story. If you want to be conscious in this one life you have, it is very different from being safe. To live to your fullest potential, your greatest version of yourself, is a whole different story than following the prescription. So many of us think, no, I can do both. 
I am a genius, I can do both. You can, but it will come at a price. Because to do both and to try to fit in in a world that demands that you look, act, talk in a prescribed way, but also to live in the new world, the new paradigm that defies the old way, is a challenge beyond capacity. So when I thought I could live both ways, I battled within myself. Because the prescribed way soon came to be a false way. When I was growing up in India and following the prescription and wanting everyone around me to feel proud of me because I was following it A++, I began to realize that I was dying inside that the voice that I knew to be my own was being completely suppressed. But there was no escape for the voice because culture is strong, you see, in your culture and mine. It doesn't allow for you to be different, too different. You can be a little different on Monday nights maybe when not, not a lot of people are watching or on a rare day that the moon is out at a certain angle. On those days, you can be different. But for the most part, it's quite clear that no one wants you to be too different. You need to fit in to the mold. It's very clear. It, you know, these messages are not even taught. You know, people always ask me in parenting, how do I pass down the values? Shouldn't I be teaching my children values? And I say to them, values don't get passed down through words. There's nothing you need to really teach because you become who it is your children will become. You embody who it is your children need to follow. It's in the being, not in the words or the ideas. So in cultures that are strong, and every culture is strong in its own way, the individual voice gets buried. The needs of the inner being, and each one of us came into this world with a desire to stamp the world with our individual identity. To be part of, but also to be celebrated as someone with an essence, someone who was seen not as a grade, not as the numbers on the weighing scale, not as the husband they marry or the wife they carry around on their arm. No, for who it is, we are. But because our parents and then their parents and the parents before them were raised suppressed by a culture that told them, no, 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 there's no room to, to create chaos. You don't need to discover who you are. I'll tell you who you are. You come from our family. You believe in this God. This is how we do things. These are the foods we eat. There, look, see, I took out all the mystery. And in their fear that we would stray, because they had the same desire when they were young that was suppressed, in this fear that we will stray, our parents keep a tight leash on us. And in, its, in our early years, we imprint upon the mind the way to be. So this mind which came into the world with a certain blueprint, with a certain North Star, with a certain direction, with a will, with a knowing, with a wisdom, was never allowed to blossom. This happened to you, this happened to me. So what did that mind, that blossoming, divine, bright, luminescent mind have to do? It had to cower in fear. And on top of its brilliance were put these prescriptions. No, don't think, follow. No, don't fit in with yourself. Don't align to yourself. Don't discover who it is you are. There's no time for that. Childhood is only 10 or 12 years and then you have to grow up. So there's no time to discover. Do that in another lifetime. In this lifetime, in this family, here. So layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, by the time we're six years old, our luminescence, the light that we had that was uniquely ours, not our cultures, not our families, not the family's names, not the religious organization we belong to. It was something inestimable, something that was un so unique, it, the world had never seen it before. But in the fear that we would follow that voice and perhaps stray too far, that light completely becomes dim. That is the unique essence that is lost in childhood. You left it behind on the pavements of your childhood, and I certainly did. And then we grow up, and it keeps trying to pop and speak 
and poke and pinch, but we keep suppressing it because now we're too afraid. Now we're too much a cookie cutter version of the parents that came before us. So we put it away and we hide behind what psychologists call an ego. We create a front. I'm happy, I'm so happy. I wanna get married too, yes, just like you. Yes, and I want to have children just like you and I wanna be just like you. And so we talk the talk and walk it and we keep forgetting our truth, our authentic self. And the ego presents to the world like you and I present every day, so happy, never really talking about our real truth because that would take too much courage. And if I did, and if you did, perhaps then your family wouldn't approve. Um, let me tell you, most certainly they will not approve. And your friends may leave you, and people may look at you like you're this unicorn, that like you're this alien, like you're speaking in tongue, like you are unrecognizable. So as I was growing up in India, and my, my inner voice, my authentic self kept poking and pulling my hair and bothering me, it created a great conflict in me. I couldn't shut it up. So I knew I needed to leave because I couldn't even hear myself in the din of culture. I knew I needed to leave. And the inner self, the authentic self, kept bubbling up and I kept pushing it down, kept bubbling up, kept pushing it down, but it would not go away. So I remember begging to my father, and no child should have to beg, but I had to, to let me leave, please. And he said, but where are you going? And I said, I don't know anywhere but here because I cannot find who it is I am and I'm dying. So he let me go on lease, you know, parents are very generous. They say you can go on a lease, you can, come, you can go but come back, it's got an expiration date. So my expiration date was one year, but I was not a fool. I was like, uh-huh, I will take the one year and never come back. Don't, I will come back, but I knew I will never come back. So I took the year, no fool was I, I wasn't going to fight and rebel, I was like, I'll take what I can, and I ran. And what I discovered when I ran is that I had been living a false self. Not a lying self necessarily, not a wicked, evil self, but entirely false. And I didn't even know who it is I was. This moment you see of awakening is a dangerous moment. I do not recommend it in a hurry. Don't want it what I went through. It's much easier to be in ignorance. It's much easier to be asleep. Because what I went through was such a shock that I had been living a lie, that almost everything that came out of my mouth were not my words, were not my thoughts, were not my beliefs. So then who was I? Who are you really? If you truly wish to discover this, do this with great forewarning. Because to take off the mask and to confront who it is you may really be takes a huge amount of courage. Because the world you see likes to live in status quo. The world likes to live in safety in conformity, because we like the boxes, you see, because when I can see you and I go, ah, okay, you're from that family, you believe in this, and you wear these clothes, and now I know you. So when I know you, I feel comfortable. But when I don't know you, then you make me question who you are, and you make me question this moment, and then I have to discover who I am, and that's too scary. So this matrix we live in, you see, is an illusion. Life as you know it and have known it prior to the moment of awakening is an illusion. And when you realize, as I did, that I had been a sleepwalker, really a zombie, a little puppet to my parents, and that I really couldn't even blame them because they were just doing what they could do to the level of their consciousness, but there was no one around that was really awake there begins the process of true courage. Should I walk out or should I walk back? And the little matchbox of my life that it was, as small as it was, was so comfortable. I knew its four corners, I knew the language, everyone understood me, everyone approved. But to walk out, 
out of the cave. You know, Plato's allegory of the cave was something I read when I was uh, maybe 19 years old. I wrote it in my journal, not even understanding it. I just knew that the words made sense to me. You can read it when you go home. Plato talks about how everyone is sitting inside the cave, shackled to each other and their, their seats, their benches. And on the screen, on the cave wall in front of them, they see shadows. They don't know that the shadows are shadows. They think the shadows are real people and real objects and real life. So they sit there shackled, watching in awe the shadows, not knowing that they are shadows. And one day, one person unshackled himself and walked out of the cave. And when he walked out of the cave, his eyes first were blinded by the sun that he didn't even know was there. And then he realized, oh my goodness, those shadows are caused by the sun. They're not even real things, but we've, we've been watching it like real life, but it's a movie. So he came back excitedly to tell everyone else in the cave, oh my goodness, look what I discovered, I discovered the truth. But to his dismay, no one was ready to not only unshackle, to even turn their head. So the question then is, is the awakening that we all desire only given to those who are brave enough to walk out of the cave? So this illusion you see, just like them watching the shadows, thinking it's real life, so it is you and I, when we were raised, we bought into culture's prescriptions, thinking they were real. We thought we were our A grade. We thought we are our number on the weighing scale, women at least. Men think they are what they earn. They think they are how they protect and provide. And while that may be an element, it isn't certainly the whole truth of who it is we are. So you and I, we bought into the illusion of life. When I had a daughter, the only name I could think of was the Hindi, the Indian language equivalent of the word illusion. So every time I call her, I am reminded that lest I think she is mine, it is an illusion. She is an illusion. My ownership over her is an illusion. My control over her is an illusion. So every time I yell at her as a parent, Maya, come here, pretending to be full of power, I know this is an illusion. So, culture's ways, these things we all are following on a daily basis, hungry for validation, for approval, for wanting to be in the box, for wanting you to like me, please like me, please tell me that I am worthy. This search on the outside for who it is we are on the inside is something that will keep us away from discovering our truth. This hunger, this quest that we think we need to be on to look for success, diamonds, jewelry, the corner corporate office, shoes, wealth, glitz, glamour, beauty, youth. All this that we are running after is an illusion. You are looking at shadows on the wall and thinking that is meant to be your life. What if you dared to walk out of the cave and discover who it is you are? You see, the process of discovering who it is you are cannot be given from a teacher on a stage. It cannot be given from an author in a book. It is something that you have to decide and declare that you want to embark on. It is a quest. It is a journey. It is a journey that you owe yourself in this one life you have. So when children come into our lives, most of us are asleep. When I had my daughter, I, was, I had not yet fully woken up. I thought I had, but not quite. Because when children come into your life, how many of you here are parents? Most of you. When children come into your lives, 
They can either come into your lives for you to repeat the same patterns of putting them back to sleep as you were put back to sleep. You could inject them with the same sleep walking medicine that you were injected in. You could tell them how to believe, what to believe, when to believe, how to be. Or you could make a different decision. You could decide that the pattern stops here. That this next generation will be brought up in a completely different, disruptive way. You see, we all want to change. People come to, come to me for therapy wanting to change the other people in their lives. Nobody really wants to change. Why would you want to change? You're perfect. The first thing people tell me when I do conscious parenting workshops, guess what it is? I'm already conscious, Dr. Shafali. So I tell them, no, you have five senses. That doesn't mean you're conscious. Just because you can see, talk, smell, hear, doesn't mean you're conscious. To be conscious means to disrupt the pattern. So people come to me wanting to change, and I know already, no one really wants to change, because to really change would mean to disrupt. To disrupt would mean to not fit in. To not fit in would mean to live in fear for a while, because no one would really approve of you. And that phase, which I call no woman's land or no man's land, is terrifying. You know, it's the, the stage between your short haircut and the long haircut, and we women know. It's that stage which just you don't want to leave the house. It happens to you in your psyche. When things are not yet, the old cannot work, but the new is not yet. And it's that in-between phase that keeps us stuck in marriages that are dead, in relationships that are abusive, in jobs that are passionless, in lives that have no spirit. It's that fear of that in-between, the X factor, the unknown of life. So when people come to me and say they want to change, I let them know that if they really wanted to change, they need to first be prepared to completely get rid of the old. So that means they must be prepared to die. Because in order to change, you have to go through a process of death. And this is something you don't want to go through. So understand this in your life. When you are unhappy, when you are depressed, when you are withdrawn, when you are lonely, and you say, I wish things could change. Understand this, there's nothing to change on the outside. The outside are shadows that you believe are real. There is no other. There is no enemy. There is no person on the outside who can love you, give you validation, worth, esteem. There is nothing. It's an illusion. So when you say, I want things to change, understand first, there's nothing to change but you. The thing you're seeking to change is in your mind. I said in the beginning, the greatest weapon of mass destruction, your greatest enslaver, your abductor, is not on the outside. It may appear in the guise of your parents. Oh, definitely it appears in the guise of your parents. It can appear in the guise of your priest or your imam or the God you believe in. It can appear in the disguise of your of your boss, it doesn't matter, of your partner. The disguises are plenty, but they're all shadows that you believe to be real. The only true liberator is the inner awakening. Your consciousness rising to realize that your mind, ye high, was abducted. So that is the process of awakening. So if you say next time that you want things to change, understand immediately that means the requirement, the prerequisite, is that you have to change something in your life. Now, making that choice, even realizing that you have a choice, is a formidable insight. You have choice. You have choice not only for yourself, but certainly for your children. And that's why parenting is the opportunity to heal the past, 
for the future. Parenting is your opportunity to awaken the next generation. You may not be brave enough to change your old. You may not be brave enough just yet to get rid of your old patterns. That's okay. But it is time for you to be brave to set your children free. So the first awareness you have as a parent in order to set them free, in order for them to become conscious, to achieve, is to understand that your children are not yours. I know you come from a culture where everything is ours and we believe in the we. I came from a same culture, a similar culture of the collective. But in the collective, the individual dies. So when you realize that your child and your ownership over your child is a maya, is an illusion, then you realize that you owe it to your child to hear their destiny, to allow their spirit to unfold. And here you are pulled from the back by tradition, by culture. Understand that the tradition and culture, if steeped in fear, is only going to limit your children. So take from your tradition the things that you can play with, with joy. The things that you can enjoy with mischief. But the things that make you bound to it through fear and solemn gravity are things that are then unconsciously abducting you. Life is an illusion. And life, because it's an illusion, is eternally playful. You can play with all of this. You can wear your Louboutins and put some lipstick and pretend to be a great provider. You can play as long as you understand it is a game, an illusion. So it is your child. You believe your child came through you because you birthed it. You have the marks on your body to show for it. You're like, this child came through me. Yes, but this form itself is only part of our reality. This, this form, this hair, this body, this, this structure that we are housed in is only part of your reality. There is a whole other part of your reality that is your essence, that is the spirit within you, that unquantifiable beingness that is within you that is ignored. When I ask you, let me ask you right now, what do you see in this room? You will say that you see, what do you see in this room? A stage, people, lights, a screen. You see illusions now, don't you? But you don't see, there's something huge you don't see. Huge you don't see. Something quite basic. You don't see it. You don't say to me, I know you see it, but you don't say to me that you see the air, the space. You know why? Because we are not accustomed to seeing that which is not in form. We're not accustomed to seeing that what sustains us is something beyond the five senses. Yes, we can breathe it in. Yes, we can feel it. But because it's not obvious, we don't see it. So it is with life, and so it is with our children. Because the structure says they come through us, we ignore that they have an essence that can never be possessed or contained by us. Our children are not ours. So when I first began teaching this, people thought I was a three-headed, you know, devil. And they could not believe that their children were not theirs. It took me a long time to explain to people what I meant. Yes, they may come through you, and Khalil Gibran talks about it beautifully, but they cannot belong to you. The decision we make that someone belongs to us, our children, our parents, our husbands, our wives, our friends, our bodies belong to us, is a fundamental delusion. And nature will show you that nothing belongs to you. 
because life is essentially impermanent. Life is never belonging to anything. Life simply is in the moment and then the next moment and constantly transforming. Who you are right now wasn't who you were when you were a teenager. Just by that, your teenage self, in a way, died. So life is constantly dying more than it is even living. Your children are here dying to the possession of you and owning and birthing themselves to their new self, their essence. So when you realize that your children are not yours, then you realize that all your attachments to them are coming from you. From where? From your fears. Your children, you believe, are your mirrors. In a way they are, but you believe they're your mirrors as in the exact replica of you. And here lies the danger. And here is where the pattern gets repeated over and over again. Your parents thought they owned you. And you may think in a very subtle subconscious that you own your children. And as long as you do, you will not be able to liberate them to become the people they're meant to be. So in my work as, as a conscious parenting teacher, you can imagine that many parents get very upset with me. So they will bring their son or daughter to therapy and they'll tell me to fix them. He has ADHD or she has anxiety or she doesn't go to sleep on time or doesn't eat her carrots and peas or talks back at me or doesn't listen. Fix her or him, Dr. Shefali. And then when I tell them to come into the room, they say, oh, you know, I'm going to go get a manicure or I'm going to go to Starbucks, but I'll be back. You do your work with, your, with my kid. You fix my kid, I'll be back. So then I tell them, uh, you are not going anywhere. And they go, I'm not. It's not me who's the problem. It's Samantha, it's Johnny, it's Alice, it's not me. So when I tell them, I'm so sorry, cancel your manicure appointment and you can have your coffee later, but you're going to be in the room and your children are going to sit outside, they are not happy. We would rather there be something wrong with our children than look at who it is we are. And parent after parent after parent, when I show them that this is all about you, you projecting, you putting onto your children, just like the sun put on the cave walls shadows, you putting onto your children your illusions and expecting them to be theirs. And then when they're not theirs, there's chaos. There is the need to punish, to discipline, because our children who want to be their own spirit, when not allowed, will pay a price, just as we did. You can only have two kinds of children really in the world, those who comply and those who rebel. The ones who comply are called good. We love compliant children. Those who don't, who dare to have a voice, who dare to ask too many questions, who dare to be different, we call them bad children. Oh, he's my troublemaker. How many of you have one person, one kid in your family, many of you have three or four, one who is your troublemaker? Right? And you look at him and you go, how did this one come about? And then you're like, oh, yeah, I know, my mother-in-law. <laughs> and this one, it's as if they were born to drive you crazy. You're like, I don't know how he knows all my weak points and my weak spots or how she knows. But every day, they seem to poke it. As if they were on this earth, I produce them to bother me every day, to give me a headache, to drive me crazy, to turn my hair white. Don't you feel like that about some children? Personally, as if they've been personally sent by some public enemy to drive you crazy. Because they are weapons that are so specifically honed to know how to bother you. And they do it every single day. And this child, we can't wait for them to grow up. We can't wait for them to go to sleep. We can't wait for them to grow up. We're like, this one I'm not going to miss so much. Why? Not because they're necessarily bad, but because they bother our status quo. They bother our belief systems. They take our little matchboxes and they squash them. And we're like, don't, don't, that's my beautiful little matchbox. I live in it, I've painted its walls beautifully. Do you see every wall has beautiful architecture? I picked the colors of every wall. 
but the child realizes it's a matchbox that it can squish with its feet, and you can't bear that it has seen through your illusions and wants to shatter them. So this child is cast aside as bad. We send them to boarding school, we put them on medication, we send them to therapy, we tell their future partners, mm, I don't know about this one. Or you actually don't say that, you hide the truth, you're like, he's lovely, he's wonderful. She's my most favorite child, please marry them quick. So forever, we look at life as good or bad. But the good and bad is not good and bad inherently. It's just good and bad if it matches you or doesn't match you. Even the people in your life, and you're one of somebody in somebody else's life, don't think they're loving you or you loving them because of who it is they are in essence. You're only loving them and being loved by them because you make them feel good about their matchbox. Try shattering the matchbox. How about you go out today and try shattering the matchbox a little bit. Try saying to the person who loves you so much, you know, actually, I don't like this about you, and I wonder why you do this all the time. And watch as you squish their matchbox, even just one pillar of one wall, watch how quickly their love for you fades away. Our love you see for people, this is another tragic epiphanic truth, is at best, at best, unconditional once in a while. It is mostly conditional based on how erect they can keep our inner matchboxes. That's it. Your child prescribes, they are good children. Your children don't prescribe, they're not good. They are trouble, they are in difficulty, they have emotional problems. You tell the therapist and the teacher that this child has an emotional problem because they can't fit into the matchbox. Our love for each other, your partners especially, and you can ignore and deny what I'm saying, but deep down you know it's the truth, that you love them conditionally. The conditions are how good they make you feel, whether they follow your prescriptions or not. And when people threaten the inner belief systems, when people shake it up, you cast them aside. So in my professional life and personal life, I have been cast aside many, many, many times. People have stood up in conferences to tell me how distasteful my views are, how my speech and my thoughts will take me straight to hell. My family has, some of them have walked away, moved away from me, and I've had to pay the price of that abandonment. And I had to ask myself, well, am I really being abandoned? Who is being abandoned? Oh, my true self is being abandoned. And my true self, if it's being abandoned, then it was never really honored in the first place. Because the love that I got or thought I got until this moment before the abandonment was only for my false self. So here it is we are, you see, we interact with each other, false self to false self each of us making the other comfortable. The abandonment is only when the true self shows up, when the true courage shows up, when you make people uncomfortable, when you make them realize that they could be in falsity, that they could be in illusion. People don't like that, you see? So here it is, you're feeling like you're being, you're being abandoned or rejected or betrayed. It's probably only because your true self showed up. So this is the courage it takes in order to make change. The courage to realize that you can never really be rejected, that you can never really be abandoned. Only the false self gets the validation of the masses. Every leader knows this. Every leader knows that the masses will follow what is comfortable for the masses. It is only the iconoclasts, the mavericks, the spiritual warriors that will listen to the calling of a revolutionary message. So this is the price to pay, the choice to make. Do you want the following of the masses that follow the false self? Or would you rather 
a solitary, more lonely, perhaps more isolated journey of a rebel who lives in true self. The choice to make is individual. You cannot get permission from anyone on the outside because there is no one on the outside. We live our lives thinking cattle with a string to our neck to look on the outside. Our eyes are seduced, hypnotized, addicted to look on the outside. If you like me, I like me. If you think I'm beautiful, I think I'm beautiful. If I match the billboard, then I'm worthy. This is a fundamental recipe for mental illness, for a culture that will never wake up, for an individual that will be suppressed. Eyes looking outward. The only way to truly know who it is you are and therefore the greatest gift to give your children is to understand that the journey is inward. What that means is that every human you think has an impact on you doesn't even exist. The five people you're scared of in your life, you know, when I ask people, what's stopping you from making change? They'll say, well, I'm scared of, of this one or that one. I'll count. I'll be like, count how many people in your life you're actually afraid of to make the biggest change of your life. Tell me on one or both hands. We don't even get past two or three fingers. Ultimately, we are afraid of two or three people. And often, they are the people who are closest to us by blood or physical presence through marriage. So imagine. And then we take the fear that we have of them and we place it on other people outside. It's called projection. So we project that the, the same fear we have of these three people actually exists in her and she becomes my mother and he becomes my father and he becomes the principal I was scared of when I was five and she becomes the bully in the schoolyard. And suddenly the whole world feels like my perpetrator, like the ones I need approval from. So it is only when you realize that these people on the outside don't even exist. They are shadows on the wall of my mind and that I am truly in charge of my inner destiny and that everything I need from the outside I can actually get and only get from the inside then I liberate myself. And with this liberation, there is no choice for you but to liberate your children. You see, once you taste freedom, once you taste the joy of speaking your authentic truth, once you give up the desire to be approved, to fit in, to belong, to be cuddled, to be safe, once you let that go because you realize you didn't even need it in the first place, they were false pretenses, false blankets you were hiding under. Once you realize what that Plato's character realized outside the cave, that life is outside the cave, the truth is blinding, the truth is impenetrable, authenticity is the only way. When you taste that, you will never rob your children of their sovereign spirit. And yes, you'll dress them in the traditional clothes and you'll tell them what to believe in, but you'll tell them, this is just one way. There's a vast open terrain for you to believe different things, for you to follow different ways, for you to not believe, for you to question. Sure, this is how we've done it in our family, but there's a whole other way. So when I raised my daughter to be a whole other way, she one day came home to me and said, but what will I say if they ask me, who are you, what are you, where are you from? So I gave her a script. And to this day, she's now 16, she's so cute, she still says the same script. So for example, you know, uh, and some of you may be offended, but try not to be. Um, uh, when someone asks her what's her religion, I taught her to say, well, technically, I am da-da-da on paper, but I am so much more. 
And I always taught her to say that technically I am this, but I am so much more. And to this day, she uses the word technically because I wanted her to understand that technically is the form which we all are attached to. So give it to your friends and give it to the world. They all need to know who you are, but that's not who you are. So how to teach that? Well, this is the essence that who you are on the outside, the religion, the name, your, your, prof your profession, your career, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter. These are just roles you're playing. It's who you are technically. It's who you are to just express, but it's not who you really are. Who you really are is the, the space that you rarely recognize. It's the air in this room that you forget to acknowledge. It is something that is uniquely you that can never be put into a box. That is who you truly are. The rest, this is just the illusion. So when you understand this through your awakening, you will never rob your children again of their voice because you finally found yours. This is your gift to yourself and then to your children. The gift of recognizing that your authenticity is more important than how you make your family look. Your truth is more important than making others happy. Your courage to live your destiny is far more essential than keeping everyone around you in harmony. Yes, this may be anti-tradition, anti-culture, it doesn't matter because I've seen too many individual spirits die at the cost of peace and harmony for the status quo. True peace and harmony can only come when each individual voice is recognized for its sovereign, essential, essential, full of essence, wholeness. The mind, the mind, the mind, your mind is your entrapper. Your mind is your abductor. Your mind is your enslaver, your warden, your prisoner. Your mind, the keys to your freedom lie in your hand, into the lock of your mind. Don't wait another day for permission to liberate what lies within. Thank you. <laughs>